All right, we'll uh, get started. But before we do that, uh, a notification for those who are doing this course online. Uh, this is for the Google Classroom students and also for those who would be covering this course on the e-platform. Within the next three to four days, I will try to put up the uh, second assessment. You know, So at the most, maybe by Thursday or Friday, uh, I will really try to put up the uh, assessment for Old Testament survey. And uh, if you remember, your first assessment included just 25 questions, which means now this assessment would have 75 questions. And uh, so uh, I, by, this, by the end of this week, I will try my best to put it up. And uh, as you know, the link closes on November 25th, if I remember. So after November 25th, uh, we will not be able to you know, change the settings and give you an extension. So uh, it would be good if you can try to finish all of those 75 tick marks, because all you have to do is just tick the correct answer. Okay, It doesn't take too much work. So um, I will try to put it up by this weekend. So please keep checking your, uh, if, you're, if you're in the Google Classroom, uh, you know, check your street page to see whether it has already been posted. If you have any technical issues, open it. Try to find out if you have any technical issues. If you do, then contact uh, the you know people in charge of that. So uh, take care of all of these details uh, because uh, you know it closes by November 25th. The link would close. So um, this is for the Google Classroom students and the e-platform students. Yeah. So we did. Hosea and um, Joel yesterday, right? So today we will be beginning with Amos. Okay, so now uh, Hosea, if you remember, he started his ministry sometime when Jeroboam the second's reign was ending. Jeroboam the second, who had a lot of military successes, had a lot of economic prosperity, was in a very good condition. So during the ending of his rule, is when Hosea starts his ministry and nobody takes him seriously because the um, nation is doing so well, they think, ah, it's okay, God will forgive once again. God will not bring any kind of judgment. So they are, they don't take his message seriously. So approximately around that time is when even Amos begins his prophetic ministry. Uh, only thing, Amos is not even living in uh, northern Israel. He's in fact living in the south, but God specifically tells him to go all the way to the north and give his prophecies over there. So you have both Hosea and Amos giving messages of judgment uh, against northern Israel uh, during the same period of time. Also, we saw last time that about halfway through Hosea's ministry is when Isaiah and Micah, they start their prophetic ministry. So all these people are kind of contemporaries. All of them were doing their prophesying during approximately the same period of time. Uh, looking uh, very briefly at the structure of the book of Amos, in chapters 1 and 2, uh, there are eight prophecies given. Chapter 1 mainly contains the prophecies about the judgment which will come against the other nations. So chapter 1 is mainly about that. Part of chapter 2 talks about the judgment, I think, against Moab and uh, some other nation. And then judgment is given against the northern kingdom as well. And what is the main thing that God has against the northern kingdom? You know, like we talked last time, uh, they had a lot of religious activity going on, but it was all superficial. It was all just very shallow. And um, uh, therefore, God is not pleased with what they are doing. And uh, another thing that maybe we should remember regarding the religion of the northern kingdom is that, you know, if you remember Jeroboam when he first, uh, when God first gave him the northern kingdom, uh, what does he do? Instead of, uh, instead of, you know, trusting the Lord, he decides that it would be safer if he can start some new kind of worship in his own land so that people will not go from his land 
to Jerusalem every year for the annual feasts because he's afraid that they would be attracted towards Jerusalem and they would no longer stay loyal to him. And so if you remember, he sets up two um, golden calves, one at Dan and one at Bethel. Bethel, of course, becomes the main center of worship. So um, the, one of the main problems with Northern Israel is that they have combined the worship of Yahweh with the worship of the golden calves, which Jeroboam, the first Jeroboam, well, which he had set up. It always puzzled me and I never could really make sense of it. I was thinking, how on earth were these people worshipping uh, you know, two golden calves and thinking that they are worshipping Yahweh? It just made no sense to me until I came across one commentary, which kind of threw light on that. Um, they, what Jeroboam, Jeroboam must have told the people is that these golden calves are a representation of Yahweh. So you are still worshipping Yahweh. It's just that you're doing it through these golden calves. He must have explained something like that to them because in their minds, they were still thinking that they are worshipping Yahweh. But of course, they are not because they have combined uh, the true faith along with all of along with many other um, you know, pagan things which they have picked up from the other nations. It's something similar to what we, you know, understand in our Indian context. Uh, you have so many animals and birds which are used, you know, in the, in the Indian religions. You have the peacock, you have the tiger, uh, you have the bull. Um, now, these are representations of the, uh, you know, the Indian gods. So, uh, you know, the, the tiger is uh, not really worshipped because um, as an idol on its own, but the tiger is the vehicle on which a particular uh, goddess sits. Okay, so that tiger becomes a representation of that particular, you know, um, Indian goddess. So this was the kind of culture uh, that was prevailing at that time. And so these people had been told that you are worshipping Yahweh, but you're worshipping Yahweh as uh, through the representation of these golden calves. So it was a rather mixed up religion, a rather um, messed up uh, syncretism is the term that is used, right? The technical term is syncretism, where you take a little bit of the true faith and then you combine it with uh, things which you have picked up from other religions and you mix it all up and say, oh, wow, we are having a nice, wonderful religion. But in God's eyes, it is something fake, something false. And so even though the people were thinking, oh, we are very, very religious and we're having all of these ceremonies going on, in God's eyes, it was evil in his eyes. So Amos mainly is asked uh, to target that. So in many of his judgment, he's directly targeting the idol worship that is taking place at Bethel. And he's coming against the priest and the uh, false prophets who are over there. And uh, they don't like it because they have established themselves over there for a very long time now. They are in positions of power and influence. And they don't want this outsider coming from the southern kingdom and telling them what they should be doing with their religion. They do not appreciate it at all. And uh, um, so uh, that is a little bit of background. So chapter 1 and chapter 2 is, is those eight prophecies. Then in chapter 3 up to chapter 9 verse 10, you have five visions of judgment which God gives to Amos. And uh, the last five verses of chapter 9 is where you have five promises given. Like we see in all of the Old Testament books, God speaks judgment, but he also speaks about future hope, future restoration. And he makes it very clear that the, re the restoration will come not through Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom, but rather through Jerusalem. Okay, so... Uh, this also would not have been very good news for the people because God is saying he's going to bring restoration, but it will happen not through their capital city, but through the capital city of the south. And um, um, we saw that even uh, last time, right, you know, in uh, the book of Hosea, because when Hosea talks, he also refers to how God will, you know, restore um, yeah, through one single leader. If maybe we could read Hosea 1.11. OK, 
Okay, so um, over there it was very clearly mentioned that when the restoration happens, it will happen for both the peoples of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. It says very clearly there, the people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come out of the land. Uh, you know, and that is when uh, um, the day of Jezreel, when God once again will sow blessing rather than judgment. So uh, that is talked about. So over here, uh, Amos, when he's prophesying about restoration, he talks about how the David's fallen shelter, or in some versions, it will say David's booth is restored, is what it talks about. So maybe we could have one person read out Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Amos 9, 11. Yeah, uh, so in many of the versions, you see the term fallen shelter being used. But literally, that would be the term booth, uh, as in one small little room, like a shed. Only thing, of course, in our modern times, when we say shed, we think of asbestos sheets and all that. They didn't have asbestos sheets back then. But it's like a small construction, where it's just one single room. Um, and... Um, the same imagery is used even by Isaiah, where he talks about the booth, you know, so or, or, or the shelter. So maybe we could actually look at that and then we'll compare these two passages. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, if someone could read out. Isaiah 1, 7 to 8. I will say it on Hey, no, 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 no. I mean, at least I hope I got my reference correct. Isaiah 1, 7 to 8. Okay. Yes. So over here, we see uh, daughter Zion, that is Jerusalem, being compared to a booth in a vineyard uh, or in a cucumber field. So you would have these large fields where you're having some crop being grown. And in the middle, you would have one hut sitting over there. That is basically like a small booth. You know, the caretaker will stay over there uh, just to make sure that no one is coming and stealing from the field. Uh, so. So it's like as if there's one lonely building left over there, one tiny little construction. Everything is gone, and just that one little piece is left over there in the middle. So both Isaiah and Amos talk about this lonely shelter sitting over there in the middle of nowhere. And uh, while Isaiah talks about it you know, as, as a kind of judgment, here Amos is turning that picture around, and he says, you know what, that fallen booth which is sitting there all alone, God will restore it. Its uh, its broken walls will be you know repaired once again, and it will be rebuilt. So Amos is talking about uh, an image which Isaiah also uses, and here he is offering hope and saying that this lonely abandoned booth will in fact be restored. It will be repaired by the Lord, and uh, Jerusalem will once again have hope. So through Jerusalem, even the northern kingdom also will receive. Now, uh, before we you know, look at Amos, the prophet, a little bit about his background, uh, there's a question which was posted over here regarding the portion for the assessments. If I remember last time, we stopped with um, Judah, uh, I mean, <laughs> judges, I think. Uh, so it would just continue from there. OK, so uh, from whichever book we have not covered in the previous assessment, from there up to Obadiah. Okay, so we would stop with Obadiah for the assessments um, simply because I have not been able to cover the rest of the portion yet. Uh, but you would, of course, obviously have to start off with your assessments. Uh, so from whichever book we had left at that particular point, I'm assuming it would be Joshua onwards, if my memory serves me right, uh, up to Obadiah. That would be the portion for the assessments. And just like last time, it would be a multiple choice thing. So you would just have to tick the uh, correct answers. Uh, yes. 
So coming to Amos, uh, the prophet, a little bit about his background. Uh, if someone could read out chapter 1, verse 1 of Amos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then if we could also look at chapter seven, verses fourteen and fifteen. I was known for a friend, no one was my son of a prophet, but I was a sheep to hear and a tender of life in one of Yes. Um, so we get to know that Amos was both a farmer and a shepherd. He stayed in a place called Tekoa. Tekoa is actually a town on top of a mountain. Um, so in Indian terms, we would call it a hill station. He was staying in a hill station. And probably that was suitable weather for him to grow an orchard of sycamore fig trees. So he was basically engaged in the business of you know running an orchard. Uh, where sycamore fig trees were grown and he probably also used that land for you know grazing his sheep so he was a shepherd and a uh, orchard keeper and um, uh, we so we see that he was not formally trained in theology uh, he did not belong to one of these prophetic schools which samuel had first established if you remember, Samuel started a series of prophetic schools where people can get training on how to become a prophet, uh, how to become, how to enter into full-time ministry. Uh, Amos had not undergone any that any such training, uh, so God just uh, takes him out from a secular field and asks him to go into ministry. And uh, so, God does not look at the level of education that a person has received. God does not look at the social status that the person has. Uh, God chooses as he wishes, whomever he wants for his ministry work. However, this is not an excuse for people to not train themselves up. Because I think once the calling is given, once Amos received his calling, he must have definitely begun to train himself for the work for which God had called him. So it is true that even if we are totally uneducated the lord can call us into ministry but once we are called into ministry we must equip ourselves because god does not tolerate laziness so he would expect his people who are working for him to fully train themselves up so that they can give their very best to the kingdom of god so um, uh, it does not matter what our background is god can choose us from whatever background to serve him but once he has chosen us he expects us to train ourselves and give our very best to him. Uh, we also see another thing here. Um, uh, there's a mention about an earthquake when we look in you know, Amos 1.1, 1, 1, uh, where it says uh, he received um, the vision that he saw concerning Israel uh, two years before the earthquake. So uh, now uh, the ancient historian Josephus in his writings, he refers to this particular earthquake. He says the earthquake took place uh, around the time when Uzziah, you know, goes into the uh, holy place and burns incense, even though he's not supposed to enter the holy place. And then uh, that leprosy comes upon him. So around that time, approximately, is when this uh, great earthquake takes place. So it is around that time, it looks like, that Amos had started his uh, prophetic uh, he received his prophetic vision around that time so like we said uh, his main target was the idol worship which was taking place at Bethel and so he speaks judgment against that and it would be good for us to you know look into a little bit of detail regarding that if someone could read out Amos chapter 7 verse 7 
ke a plumb line is a very simple engineering instrument it's just a long piece of string with a little bit of uh, small weight a heavy weight attached to it and so when you hold the string this way and you have the way you no know, the weight weighing it down the string will form a straight vertical line it will not hang side sideways a little bit that way or hang you know hang a little bit this way it will not hang in a slope due to gravity it will hang exactly straight so they would use that to build their build, to build straight walls so when the construction work is going on they would hold the plumb line against the wall to see whether it's coming up exactly straight or whether it is crooked so that was basically a plumb line and over here um, in his vision this is what amos sees he sees the lord standing over there with a the plumb line in his hand and this is what the lord says if someone could read out verse 8 Yes. So the Lord is saying it's time to measure Israel and see whether it, you know, is up to the mark or not. So He says, I have placed a plumb line among the people, and I'm seeing that this wall is not straight at all. It's very crooked. So the Lord says, I cannot spare them anymore. It's time to measure them, and they measure. When I measure them, they're not up to the mark. So God says, you know, it's time for judgment to come. Therefore, He says, what does He say in verse nine? If someone could read out. Okay, so God's wording is very clear. He says, with my sword. i will rise against the house of jeroboam he's talking about how the family of jeroboam uh, the descendants would all be wiped out because god judge god's judgment is going to come upon them and now this particular piece of information when the priest of bethel amaziah when he's conveying this information to jeroboam he changes the wording a little bit he lies in fact to the king so let's see what lie he tells and we look at verse 10 if someone could read out verse 10 of the hills and the river in the south of the river in the south of the river verse 11 then the Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be left alone. Okay, so he says, you know what uh, Amos is going around prophesying, and he says the land is not able to bear the words that he is speaking. He says this Amos is is saying that you, O king, will be will die by the sword. Amos never said that. The Lord said the sword will come against the house of Jeroboam. He never said that Jeroboam personally will be killed by the sword. That is not what God says. Why did Amaziah change the wording and make it so personal to Jeroboam? He was hoping that the king will now sit up and take action against Amos. So he was trying to stir up the king against Amos. And so he says this man is prophesying that you will die by the sword, which obviously would have caught Jeroboam's attention. So Amaziah does not like. his position being threatened all these prophecies of judgment which amos is speaking against the idol worship that is going on in bethel he is against these words of amos and so he wants to get rid of amos um if uh, you, you know if, if you look at verse 12 he says to amos get out you seer you know they were called seers because they could see the future the prophets were called seers so he says get out you seer go back to the land of juda earn your bread there and do your prophesying over there so why have you come over here to uh, to prophesy you want to earn your livelihood go back home and earn your livelihood over there and then amos replies and says you know what i'm not earning a livelihood because i'm not a prophet i'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet but the, uh, and he, he says in fact i'm a shepherd and i'm you know a a, a keeper of sycamore fig trees but the lord took me from tending the flock and said to me Go prophesy to my people, Israel. So he says, 
because god has sent me that's why i'm over here not to earn a livelihood but to declare what god is wants to do against this nation and he goes on to give a very shocking prophecy um and uh, in verse 17 yeah if someone could read out verse 17 So imagine you're standing in front of a very powerful, influential man, the high priest of the temple of Bethel, somebody in a very, very high and respected position. And this is what he says to him. He says, your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. And you yourself, you'll die in a pagan country. You'll be taken away as an as a exile and you will die over there. Those are the words that he speaks out against uh, Amaziah. So Amaziah would have been extremely angry with uh, with Amos for the words that he is speaking. Um, if we can also read Amos chapter 3, 14 to 15. Okay, so God talks about the kind of destruction which will come upon the northern kingdom. He says, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and they'll fall to the ground. And not just the temple is going to get destroyed. And this temple which has now been dedicated to a golden calf and where you have heathen things going on. Not only will the temple be destroyed, but God goes beyond that and he says, I will tear down the winter houses and the summer houses, the houses which are decorated with ivory, you know, and he says all these big, big mansions and bungalows, they will all be demolished. Now, I wonder how many bungalows uh, made of ivory, uh, you know, were owned by Amaziah and his wife. They were very well off. They were very influential. They were very powerful, which is why they do not want Amos coming over here and threatening their position. And now God is saying, you know, all these wonderful fancy houses that you people have, I will destroy all of them. So uh, we see that, you know, uh, according to this prophecy, the sons and daughters would be killed. They would be finished off. As for this man, Amaziah himself, he would be taken away as an exile, um, they, you know, uh, to Assyria. So basically here in the land, only the wife would be left, which means she would be in a penniless condition with all the wealth gone and no one to support her, which is why she would be reduced to a state of, you know, entering into prostitution. So we see all these things which God says um, against the, you know, Amaziah and his family. It's because he refuses to repent of his, uh, you know, idol worship. In fact, he's encouraging the people to participate in idol worship. So this is the judgment which God speaks against him. So the, these are just some of the things that um, uh, we see in the book of Amos. Uh, coming very quickly to the book of Obadiah. Obadiah, again, is um, not a very great uh, person with a very fancy background. It, um, he, because there is no, it's not mentioned that he came from any, uh, you know, um, royal lineage or that he came from any line of priests. He was just a very ordinary person who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, okay, all the discussions that are going on. Uh, okay, so Obadiah mainly he talks about the judgment which will come against Edom. Okay, and um, Maybe we should actually read verses 11, uh, okay, um, uh, Obadiah verses 11 to 14, if someone could read out, please. Should not have ended the day of the 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that should be enough. So here in these verses, it's talking about uh, destruction that will come upon Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be invaded and Jerusalem will be destroyed. It will be occupied. So scholars are um, not very clear on which particular event this is talking about. So some say that it's probably the Babylonian invasion when Babylon comes and you know invades and takes over Jerusalem. On the other hand, a lot of scholars say this is talking about an earlier event. It's not talking about the final fall which happens when the, when the Babylonians come. It's talking about something which took place earlier in the 9th century uh, when uh, Jerusalem was attacked by the Philistines and the Arabs. Okay, so um, because according to the kind of dating they do, uh, Obadiah would have done his prophesying at a much earlier time period. And he was talking about an occasion when um, you know Jerusalem was attacked not by the Babylons, Babylonians, but rather by the Philistines and Arabs. Uh, we see a reference to that in Second Chronicles 21, 16 to 17. Uh, if someone could just read that, please. Second Chronicles 21, 16 and 17. All right, so here we see that, um, you know, this man Jehoram was very evil in God's eyes. He was the son of the godly King Jehoshaphat, you know, the Jehoshaphat who had, uh, who's always, you know, there, there are many sermons about Jehoshaphat, the man of faith. So Jehoshaphat was a very godly man, but his son Jehoram was very evil. When Jehoshaphat was dying, he in fact gives the kingdom to Jehoram. He says, you know, you, you are the one who's going to be sitting on the throne. So Jehoram is given the throne freely by his father. But once Jehoram comes to the throne, he's like, what if my brothers try to climb the throne? What if they try to, you know, um, you know, put me, put me down? And so he murders his entire family. I mean, what a heartless man, his own brothers, his own family members. He kills the whole lot of them, a complete massacre. So God is very much against Jehoram. And uh, in fact, he dies a very horrible, horrible death. So anyone who wants to know the details can go to Second Chronicles chapter 21 and find out all about it. But he dies in such a horrible manner that the people who see God's judgment upon him, they don't even bother giving him a royal funeral. So he dies a very, in a very horrible way because of the way he behaved with his own family. Okay, so this was the horrible man that Jehoram was. And God, to bring judgment against him and you know all his officials who are participating in this evil act, God allows the Philistines and the Arabs to come and attack Judah. So uh, they say, most scholars agree and say, that Obadiah is probably referring to that invasion of Jerusalem. And why do we agree with that? Mainly because when the Babylonians finally come later and uh, you know take uh, take Jerusalem, at that time we don't read in any of the historical works that any kind of partnership was done between the Edomites and the Babylonians. When they come, they are powerful enough to come on their own and do the invasion on their own. They don't look for you know help and partnership with anyone else. If in all the writings that we see about the fall of Jerusalem, we see no reference to any partnership being made between the Edomites and the Babylonians. So most probably here when Obadiah is criticizing Edom the way they behaved, 
he's probably talking about an earlier invasion of Jerusalem and not about the final invasion which takes place later on in 586 BC. This is about an earlier incident which took place in 9th century BC. All right. So um, this is mainly God's judgment against Edom. Um, he is uh, angry with them because they did not behave a way, the way a brother nation should have behaved. Because technically, uh, Jacob and uh, Esau were twins. They were brothers. So their descendants would basically be brother nations. And he says Edom has not behaved like a brother nation to Israel. And uh, so this prophecy is given against the kingdom of Edom. And um, Obadiah being the shortest chapter and uh, sh shortest book in the, in the Old Testament does not have any chapters. It's only 21 verses in length. Uh, so looking, just look very briefly at the structure of Obadiah. Uh, the first nine verses is where it talks about the pride and the wickedness of the Edomites. And then you have uh, verses 10 to 14, where God criticizes them for the way they have treated Jerusalem. And then uh, you have the last few verses, 15 to 21, where it talks about how in the end, uh, Israel will be victorious. So let's just very briefly look at some verses so that we have a clearer picture of what God says. Um, so the first portion, which talks about the pride of Edom and the wickedness of Edom, um, it maybe we could read out verses three and four. Someone could. Mm. Yeah. So uh, Edom was. Uh, situated in the mountains uh, southeast of Israel. So the mountain mountainous region southeast of Israel is basically where you had the um, kingdom of Edom. And because there is a mountainous region, it was very easy to defend it. Any enemy army that wants to come and fight would have to come through the valley and start climbing up. And these people can already see them from the top. And it will be easy for them to topple boulders on them, you know, crush them. It would be easy to throw arrows at them. It would be very easy to fight uh, an enemy because they are already on top in a very secure position and the army has to, the army, enemy army has to literally struggle to come to them. So uh, they are very proud and they say to themselves, who can bring me down to the ground? And then the Lord says, even though you are, you soar like an eagle and you have made your nest among the stars, you know, high up in the mountains, even though you have done that, God says, there I will, from, from there I will bring you down. And um, in verse 13, you have uh, God you know, um, criticizing them for the things which they have done to Judah during that invasion which takes place. Um, that would be verse, if someone could read out verse 13. So he says, when the Philistines and the Arabs were attacking, you joined them. You entered through the gates. You also participated, you know, in, in ransacking the whole place and in looting the property. So you also indulged in all of these things. And moreover, it says, you know, you should not have gloated over them. They were happy to see Israel. They were happy to see Judah falling. They rejoiced in the misfortune of the people. And um, um, I think it was verse 14, which you read out, where it says, you know, um, they were standing at the crossroads. If someone could read out that crossroads verse once again. Hmm. So you see when that invasion took place and people are running for their lives. Uh, what some of these Edomites did is they, was, they stood near the crossroads and the people who are trying to escape, they caught hold of them and they surrendered them to the Philistines. So instead of showing mercy and protecting them and sheltering them, they chose to you know, side with the enemy. So God says, this is not the way a brother should behave towards a brother. And so God speaks judgment against them. And this is what God says in verse 18, if someone could read out.
So the Lord says Esau or Edom over here, the descendants of Esau, will be like dry hay. And what happens when fire comes near the dry hay? You know, the whole thing just burns up. So God says that Jacob will be like a fire, Joseph will be like a flame, and Esau will be like dry hay and will get completely burnt up. Uh, so the Edomites, when the time came for them to be judged, uh, they were completely defeated. Um, later on, you had another kingdom you know, come and occupy that area. They were called the Hashemite kingdom or something. No connection to Edom in any, in any way. And uh, so basically the Edomites stopped existing. You know, they got wiped out because of the way they had treated uh, Judah. So God's judgment comes upon them. Uh, and, uh, you know, Esau is always criticized by everyone, hated by everyone. And I feel sad for that because there was a good side to him, you know. And uh, I thought maybe we could just touch a little bit upon that. Um, because you see... The one who was doing all the crooked deeds and the cheating and the lying and the deceiving was this man, Jacob. Esau was the innocent party. And, uh, you know, he deceives, Jacob deceives uh, Esau into giving up his birthright. And then not only does he deceive Esau, he dece deceives their old father. I mean, you know, your aged father who can't even see properly. What a hard heart you must have to go and, you know, deceive a man like that poor man is sitting over there trusting his children. And you openly go and deceive. I think Jake was quite a rotten person in his youth. You know, so, um, so Esau is definitely the wrong party. And so Esau is extremely angry. And, you know, we, we read in Genesis that he, may, he decides that he's going to murder his brother. Once the parents are dead, he doesn't want to do it when the parents are still alive because he doesn't want to hurt them. He doesn't want to wound them. He thinks, after my parents are dead, then I'll finish this man for what he has done to me. It's the decision he makes in his heart. And then, of course, we know, we know the rest of the story. Jacob escapes. He goes away from there. And then when he comes back, when situations and circumstances force him to a point where he can no longer live under Laban, what he had done to Esau, Laban is doing to him every day over there. So life becomes really tough for him and he's forced to come back. And he thinks, when I come back, I'm going to be finished. Esau is waiting for me. But we see what a transformation in Esau. I mean, a man who had decided in his heart that he's going to murder his brother shows love, shows forgiveness. It says he goes running to, you know, Jacob is standing over there, you know, bowing down seven times, like, you know, really scared. And Esau goes running to him, hugs him, kisses him. What a heart of forgiveness. So Esau actually had a good side. Where Esau fell and fell really hard is that he had no heart for spiritual things. It's very, very sad. The man had no interest in spiritual things, which is why it says in Hebrews chapter 12, you know, that he took his birthright so lightly, like as if it's just a matter of properties. No, there was a spiritual significance to the whole thing. And he just took this, uh, that so lightly. Later on, even when he's thinking about marriage, he does not marry uh, someone who you know believes and follows Yahweh. He chooses to go and marry Hittite ladies. And in fact, it says that those two Hittite women were a great sorrow for his parents. Uh, I mean, goodness knows what and all they were doing in that house. They were creating a lot of havoc. So Esau, from the beginning, had no interest in spiritual matters. And I think that really was his downfall. Um, so, in fact, his wives, they lead him away. And I don't think he was even a follower of Yahweh. He chooses to follow the Hittite religion, probably. So, um, but one thing we learn is that Esau sets a godly example to his children about how brothers should treat brothers. You know, there are more details that we could get into regarding uh, Esau and, you know, his interactions with um, Jacob, because those some details about it are mentioned in your chapter 33, chapter 36, where you get to know a little more background and the amazing way Esau treated his brother. Um, so Esau went out of his way to set a godly example to his children about how brothers should treat brothers. But the children of Esau do not learn that lesson. And we see that, um, you know, all the descendants of Esau, they from the very beginning, they choose to 
uh, treat Israel in a bad manner, in an unbrotherly fashion. So right from the beginning, their attitude towards their brother nation is one of hostility, uh, one of how they can take advantage. So God was against them for this, uh, you know, uh, from the beginning. But that is not how Esau behaved. Esau set a good example uh, because he married, uh, you know, heathens and um, he allowed those values and principles to influence his household. His family did not follow the example which he had set. Uh, so, you know, uh, God finally brings judgment upon Edom when the time comes and Edom is completely destroyed. Okay, so this is just some of the things that we could, you know, talk about um, from the book of Obadiah. So, any questions? I was supposed to word of prayer. The same way Jehoshaphat was a very, very godly man, a man of faith, and his son Jehoram was a mass murderer. Sometimes the children don't follow in their father's footsteps. We could talk a lot about the households and families of ancient Israel and the way they were run. They don't run like our modern family units. So yes, they had their drawbacks, but we can't discuss all that right now because we literally have one minute to, to go. Uh -huh. That's definitely out of our portion for today. So, yeah, close your eyes, close your eyes, we'll pray. After that, we'll discuss these things uh, because it's completely irrelevant. Someone has asked about... Um, the links to the faith class. You know what? I'll quickly send a um, thing SMS to the concerned person, and then they'll they'll deal with this. All right. So definitely, I'll I'll see to it. I'll take care of it um, because I know who basically you know does these things from the office. So I'll uh, speak to that person and inform them. So they'll take care of the uh, you know the links which you have asked for. All right. So. Um, yeah. oh, okay. The class is over. Is Fine. Yeah. Okay. We'll 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 um. Uh, I'll I'll speak to the concerned people anyway. Let's just close with a word of prayer, please. Yes. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, the lessons that we can learn from the book of Amos and the book of Obadiah. Lord, uh, we pray that um, our focus uh, would not be on worldly things. That we would not take worldly things and mix them up with the true faith, and then pretend that we are following you. Help us, O oh Lord to uh, retain the pure doctrine which is taught in the Old Testament and New Testament and not turn away from that, O oh Lord. Help us, Lord, not to be worldly in our mentality and to mix up the things which you have taught us with the things of the world and pretend that we are following you. I pray that you would help us, O oh Lord, not to be, uh, um, uh, be double-minded uh, in, uh, in our walk with you, O oh Lord. Also, we pray... Uh, that uh, unlike the people of Edom, uh, we would treat our brothers in Christ in a godly manner. We pray, O oh Lord, that sometimes even though it is difficult for us to adjust to one another, we would be united because for you, unity matters a lot. How we treat our brothers and sisters is very, very important to you. And you're always looking to see how we treat those uh, who are part of your family. Help us to be very careful, O Lord, in the way we treat others. Because one day you will judge us for the words coming out of our mouths and the, uh, the attitudes of our hearts and for the actions that we take against people. Lord, we will be judged. So help us to be careful and to honor you in all of our interactions. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. And thank you for those of you who are online. Thank you.